Hi, welcome to Cloud Cover. I'm Steve Marks. And I'm Wade Wagner, uh, with a little bit of tan and a lot of beard. Yeah, but uh, it's, good, it's good to have you here, Wade. Um, after last week, of course, you and Vittorio, Vittorio pretending to be me. That wasn't actually me. No, 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 no. That was just still Wade. Now it's back, the two of us. Yes. So it's always good to have Steve and Wade together. Yeah. Uh, Wade's not actually here. Wade is in Europe. Uh, doing, I, I don't even know what country he's in right now. He was yeah. in Belgium, but I'm not sure he's there. I'm pretty sure he is in Amsterdam right now. Anymore, <laughs> Amsterdam <laughs> is where he is. Yeah, so who, who, right who then are you, they're wondering? Uh, okay, so if I'm not Wade Wagner, I'm Karan Deep Anand. Uh, I'm the group program manager with the App Fabric team. And you are here because we are going to be talking about the uh, exciting brand new release of the Windows Azure App Fabric caching service. Mm -hmm. I tried to put as many words in there as I could. <laughs> um, so we'll talk about caching. That's going to be our feature. But of course, before that, we're going to cover a little bit of news. And then we will wrap up with a tip of the week, as always. Um, so let's dive into the news first. Uh, the first item up, this is over on the Windows Azure Connect team blog. Um, and this is about basically a refresh to the refresh <laughs> SDK 1.4, is that it? So the version now, it should eventually read after you do this all. Um, actually, I'm not sure that's even, the, that may be the before. Okay, anyway, go uninstall the SDK 1.4. Go get the new SDK 1.4. Uh, it was changed at 4 p.m. Pacific time on April 25th. And this is to resolve an issue with Windows Azure Connect, uh, where basically you... Um, you could fail to deploy the 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 uh, endpoint on on your Windows Azure role. So anyway, bug with this kind of broke some things. If you're using Connect, bottom line, go get the new version. That's all that changed. This is just that one bug fix. So it's safe to go pick that up and not worry about it. Um, okay. What else do we have? I kind of wanted to point this out. Uh, I it's been a long time since I've talked to the guys at NewsGator, um, but they uh, they are still around and doing stuff, and they're doing, what, 3 million blog posts per day that they're aggregating using Windows Azure. There's this nice video up on Channel 9. Um, they're using a number of different pieces of the platform. Mm -hmm. They're heavily using storage. They had a lot to say about learning to use storage properly. Um, it's just a kind of cool, it's just if you're looking for another example of a customer who's using Windows Azure, what their experience was like, um, check this one out. And finally, deploy to Azure. One. This is your favorite one. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, this is uh, this is basically integration into your TFS build process mm -hmm. for tasks like deploying to Windows Azure. Um, it's basically it's a it's it's sort of a rolled up there are a bunch of little pieces component tasks that you can can make part of your uh, part of your build process and the the big scenario is basically to make as part of your build automatically deploying up probably to staging in Windows Azure right. uh, for your sort of continuous integration stuff. Significantly helped our productivity. Yeah. yeah. You're using this yeah. this project is actually... Yeah, for a lot of our internal sample oh. apps that we build, we end up using this. It works really well. Very cool. Okay, good. So there's a, there's a first-hand <laughs> endorsement. I hadn't actually gotten to use it yet, <laughs> um, but I actually I got a little bit of a tutorial about it um, at Mix at the booth. I, I, was, I was hanging by, and then yeah, I love it. I got this uh, got a little plug for this, and I actually it looked really good. Um, so it's good to hear it also you know actually works. Uh, <laughs> That's good. And finally, sort of tying us in, this is a bit of old news, but it is new news again because this is about. Um, from this is really the post from from Mix mm -hmm. when Mix happened and keynotes happened. And we talked about uh, access control as well as the caching service going live. This is the blog post that's there. By the time you watch this video, if you go to this blog, you're probably going to see something a little bit different. You're going to see that that caching, as of today, I, today being the day that you're watching this, which is Friday, right. uh, the 29th. 29th morning. Yes. <laughs> if, if, if everything in that timeline was right, um, then you're going to see the caching has actually shipped. And that yes. is why you were here, because uh, I wanted to make sure we had a chance to cover on this show what it means the caching has shipped, what you can do with it, um, and how people can get started. Perfect. Uh, yes, so we do have endorsements already on the on the blog post I'm looking at from Pixel Pandemic, yeah. uh, one of our early adopters of the caching service. So, yes, we'll up you know we'll refresh this blog post, provide a lot of uh, new links on how you can get started, uh, a lot of questions on pricing. People have been very eager to understand how 
much this will cost and how they can use it. So definitely look, look back at the blog post uh, and you'll find all relevant links together. So uh, do you want to get started on? Uh, yeah, yeah, let's talk about it. I mean, I, I, wonder if, I wonder if we should get out of the way the sort of like, just it's shipped, there's an SLA, there are prices, there's, uh, you can choose where it goes now. Um, we're going to show all this stuff, so I mean, yep. we can walk through it there, but I wanted to kind of, wanted to make sure people got, like, this is actually the launch of the caching service. It's been in CTP for a while. For a while now. Um, it's been about eight months, and uh, I think the first time we announced it was back in October at PDC. That was the first time we uh, disclosed the plans of having yep. cache to solve a lot of the scenarios for our fabric. Uh, with Windows Azure, and uh, this morning uh, the service has gone live with the production, which is backed by an SLA. Uh, the pricing was also announced, and uh, we share some pricing right now, which is the cache was going to be available in six different sizes, starting from 128 megabytes all the way till four gigs in powers of two. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will, <coughs> and the, the base pricing starts at $45 a month for the 128 meg cache. And but it does not increase. And the then energy. powers of two, right? So the four gigabytes one would be, that would, be a lot of money. would be what? That's thirty-two times thirty forty-five dollars, yeah. whatever. So what, I can't do math. But 1, anyway, twelve hundred something. Yeah. Yep. So that's the four gig, right? That's the four gig ish. Uh, but <laughs> you know what happened? Uh, I was going to just lock that pricing, and then somebody just hit me on the head and said, you know, might not work that well. Yeah. So the four gig is is now at uh, three hundred thirty-five. Three bucks. something, right? Yeah. Three three. three th yeah. So, so as you buy more, so the price goes down. So not powers of two, right? It is actually, if you need more cash, buy a big one instead of a bunch of small ones. Agreed. It's actually a better deal. Correct. And then, of course, you partition it and use it as appropriate. Uh, the other thing is the cash sizes are fairly dynamic, where you can move between different cash sizes. And more importantly, when you move across cash sizes, your data does get preserved. So if you decide you want to pay lower, start with a 4 gig cash, we don't really see it getting you know, used as much. You can always scale it down to two gigs, one gig, or right. in the different direction where you can start small and grow big. So that's the whole uh, idea about pricing and, and the sizes are available. The other very critical thing is that now it's available in all data centers worldwide where Azure exists. And that's, that's ex extremely important for caching because it's a service that you would typically use with another Windows Azure service. Right. So wherever you have your hosted service, you need to make sure that you use a cache in that data center. And we walk through that experience, you know, what the options look like. But make sure that you're using cache in the same data center as your hosted service to get the maximum latency benefits. Well, let me pull up your uh, your machine here and just pass you the laptop. Great. Um, and maybe we can just kind of... So what I'm going to do is uh, just walk you through uh, an end-to-end -end experience of how you get started. Uh, in this case, what I've done is I've logged on to the familiar Azure portal. So this is the Azure uh, Windows Azure portal all up. And one of the things you see is the addition of caching to the list of options you have for App Fabric services like Service Bus and Access Control. Yeah. So I'm within the caching, uh, come to App Fabric. <coughs> what you see here is, is uh, existing subscription. So I've already logged in with my live ID, which is showing my, showing my existing subscriptions. I've created two namespaces already, but I want to just, just walk you through. If you were to start fresh, what you would do is you hit a new namespace button here. And that gives you uh, options to you know, apply that to either only cache or pick the other services like Service Bus and Access Control as well. In this case, I'll just go ahead and create one namespace for, let me call this Cloud Cover Demo. I think I already took Cloud Cover by itself. So yeah, okay. you ne you'll need Cloud the Cover Demo. demo. <laughs> and uh, let me, you know, just to be sure, let me just check for availability. Yep. I don't know who else. So it looks like it is available. Uh, this was the part we were talking about earlier <coughs> where you need to pick the data center appropriately. Um, so in this case, we're just going to go ahead and pick South Central, but you can pick Asia, you can pick Europe, whatever the, right. the data centers exist. The and, second it, and that's an important choice because this is, this is tied to, you better also have your Windows Azure app in the same data center because right. the whole point of a cache is low latency access, um, not, having to, not having the expense of hitting a disk. And imagine what the expense <laughs> is if you're hitting a different continent. continent. So, so yeah. make sure you do that um, yeah. and get that right. And, and plus, you might end up paying uh, network charges in case you go across. That's true, right. There are bandwidth center. charges if you leave the data center. Mm -hmm. So you definitely don't want to do that. So, so think carefully about that choice actually make the choice up front about where you're actually deploying Correct. this stuff. Set the same settings everywhere. Um, just as the same as you do for SQL Azure and Windows Azure Storage and Windows Azure Apps. Do the same thing for caching. Yeah, shall we co-locate it? 
The other big difference uh, for those of you who have had a chance to play with this in the CDP releases were you only had two options to pick, you know, 128 meg and mm -hmm. since February 256 meg as well. Of course, now you get to see all the six options we talked about, uh, ranging from 128 megs to all the way to 4 gigs. Of course, this has a pricing implication, so the choice you make here is the money you pay at the end of the month. Um, I'll go ahead and select a 1 gig cache. That should suffice for this demo for now. And I'll go ahead and create a new namespace. Now, while this is happening, <coughs> one of the other things I want to talk about is when you switch from you know, 1 gig to, let's say, 2 gigs to increase, mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to wait for the end of the month. You can do it once per day at max, but you can change it once a day if you need to. So uh, you know, if, you, if you're expecting a higher load over the weekend for your application, you can always spin it up, spin it down. So it, you have that level of flexibility, and you get a prorated bill at the end of the month. Does it actually stop me? So if I, if I change it at 1 p.m. and then at 3 p.m., yes. I realize I clicked the wrong thing, it'll actually, I do actually have to wait for the next day to do it, or, or does only one of them count? Or uh, right. So we were expecting you to do something like that. So what we I do that sort of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> while this is activating, let me show you another namespace we just created. It actually does show you uh, if there are any pending changes to uh, your oh, size okay. quota. So it, so it doesn't even change right away. So it actually changes at the once a day, whenever once we day do that. Correct. Uh, and it, okay. <coughs> if, if you change it uh, today, then you will not be able to change it again. So we do okay. actively block you so you don't shoot yourself on the foot because okay. you don't, don't want that dynamic. <laughs> uh, but it means you should, you should actually make sure you're clicking the right thing when you do. It's not yes. that you can just sort of flip it around. It is really right. a once a day thing. And right. so, okay, okay. So That's it's good to know. down from once a month to once a day. So you choose right. once a day. Yep. Uh, so what I've done here is, you know, with a few simple clicks, created a distributed cache. Uh, I'll contrast this with if you were to go build your own cache solution in Azure, you would have to go buy a bunch of VMs, right. deploy the caching solution of your choice, uh, manage those VMs uptime, patching them, and making sure that the memory is available. Yeah. All I had to do was uh, <coughs> click a new namespace, pick the namespace, pick the data center, and get deployed my caching uh, scaled out solution for me. So, so it's as and, simple as that. And what actually happens, so behind the scenes, behind there's a, there's a service, right? I mean, the cache, exactly. caching is a service. Behind there, there are presumably a bunch of VMs with a bunch of RAM. When you just did that, did anything new get provisioned? Like what, what okay. actually happened? Did space and get back. carved off that's yes. dedicated to me? Yes. Is it, are there other people on that box too, or like what's the, the what's happening behind the covers? tenancy model? Right. You know. So it is a multi-tenant service, uh, and one of the things we do is, unlike uh, you know, a caching service or a solution that you might spin up on your own, where you have to worry about how much your operating system uses versus how much yeah. your uh, application's using, or and hence what's available for cache. What we do is, among this big cluster of cache machines that we have. We carve out and dedicate and reserve the memory for Steve. So in this case, the 1 gig or the 512 meg that you've asked for is actually blocked out for your use. Till the time you, of course, go change it. Okay. But that is a, a reserved allocation capacity because we want to make sure that the 512 meg that's been promised is always available. Okay. So you never get charge changed for that or ever get evicted. And is it on one machine, on many machines? Uh, that is a, the other part about uh, app fabric caching is it's inherently a distributed architecture, which is your cache is spread out, spread out across multiple machines. The number of machines it spe spreads out depends on the size of the cache. Okay. So as an example, for a one gig cache, we'll spin it up, you know, spread it across, let's say, approximately 10 machines. The beauty of that approach is that uh, even though we don't have a high availability option for the cache itself, in this case, mm -hmm. uh, even if one of the machines was to go down, Right. I didn't lose my whole cache. You never lose your cache. You lose at best a one tenth of your portion. cache. So that memory that gets reserved. So like, so I guess the numbers that we just had, I'd get like a hundred megabytes right. carved off per machine on each of ten different machines. Correct. Um, Correct. And then as I store things, w we distribute the keys according, according to the hashing the, scheme. Correct. And and, and right. all of those okay. uh, details that you never would have to worry about for right. you. Think of this as a, as a big virtual pool of memory available. How it's distributed, how it's managed, how it's load balanced. Because if machine, one, if we take one machine down, we make sure we move to another machine. Yeah. So all the, the good. Well, this is happens. the beauty of it. I mean, part of the reason I ask is because I think that's the value of having this as a service. Is that, uh, I mean, the reason I'm asking is because mm -hmm. it is actually a somewhat complex thing to do, yes. and then yes. it's nice to have it done for you. And so that's why I think it's nice to appreciate kind of what goes on behind the scenes. And if you were to build something like this yourself, what's all the th what are all the things you'd have to worry about? 
Yeah. It's nice that there's a service that sort of puts that all behind a front end, and basically you get an interface that is, I want to store something, or I want to, I want to get get something right. back out of the cache. And behind the scenes, we're doing the smart things. We're doing it right. We're doing a multi-tenant right. service. We're spreading across machines. We're doing. Uh, balanced. We're pulling up new machines, machines when something goes down. Right. You don't lose your whole cache when something like that happens. Um, all that is is the benefit that you're getting from this. And to receive it, actually, you did pretty much everything already that you need to do, yeah. which is a couple clicks. Done. There is actually now a cache that you can be hitting from code. Um, Great. I we'll suppose we should show. Yeah, yeah, let's let's show how you actually uh, uh, switch to the application. Well, uh, real quick, one, a couple yeah. of other things I want to show here is uh, not only do you get a portal to help you create a new cache. We've embedded a couple of uh, rich metrics as well here where you can see uh, how much of the cache you're actually using at any given time. This is very critical for your capacity planning and, and monitoring mm -hmm. your ongoing usage. So you get an idea of what my current size of the cache is at any given moment, uh, what the peak size has been in this month, so you can actually predict what my peak capacity uh, and my uh, peak size over the last one month versus last year has been. So those trends help you do a much better capacity planning going forward. Uh, in addition to, of course, getting a lot of other properties that you would typically need uh, around the security token, the endpoint. And that's the other th uh, question you asked me, Steve. Uh, is, if it's multi-tenant, how is it secure? Mm -hmm. One of the things we do is we use access control service to make sure that all the data that we write for your, for, you know, your cache is, is only accessible by an application which has that ACS token. So it's very critical that uh, this token is, is not shared, because anyone else can then uh, read that uh, cache memory as well. But it's it's guaranteed to be only accessible by the set of applications, the users which have that token. So even though it's multi-tenant architecture, it's uh, reserved and it's it's guaranteed to be secure using the familiar technology that we have with ACS. So we use ACS internally as well. So uh, one of the uh, the last thing I want to show in the portal uh, real quick is you can select uh, uh, the cache, and one of the f basic configuration options for using cache is you just use cache to power ASP.NET and offload all the session state from being in memory or from a disk store like SQL Azure to keep it in memory, yep. but in the cache. So you still get the performance benefits and the, the low latency access. And because that configuration is so common, well, we provide that as a <coughs> code snippet or a config script snippet, actually, which you can just copy paste right from the portal into your ASP.NET. And we'll just walk you through that experience, but uh, you can use this client configuration uh, snippets to directly embed in your app config. Uh, whether it's a, a regular app that you're building with gets and puts, or if you're just using it to offload the ASP.NET session state, just pick the session state section from here, and it already pre-populates with your token, it pre populates with your uh, name of the cache itself, and stick that into the ASP.NET web config. And we walk you through that experience right now. So with okay. that, Steve, I'm going to hand it over to you. You are the, the dev expert. Uh, build the application, so I'm your IT pro who just created this massive distributed cache cluster for you. Right, right. So you, you get the glory of going, yeah, I've solved all our caching problems by yeah. clicking a couple buttons. Oh, well, you don't know that. And then, <laughs> and then the poor dev, I'm going to have to do a ton of work to integrate caching into my hmm. app. Wow. And That's I'm going to pay the big bucks. I'm going to complain bitterly about it, and I'm going to spend weeks doing it. And uh, but I will let you guys in on the secret, which is um, this is the entire code for this <laughs> app. That let's let's pull up the app and actually show. Um, you guys can you guys can do this too. It's uh, uh, I have to figure out what keyboard layout I'm on. Uh, cloud cover cache dot cloud app dot net uh, is the greatest UI I've ever created. Um, so you can say foo equals bar and press the save button, and then you can look up foo, and it says bar. Um, so that's basically <laughs> it. But it's just showing, here's how you set a key and a value, and then here's how you look up by that key. And that's the code that this is the entire, that's the controller. It's an ASP not an MVC3 app. This is the entire, you are seeing the entire mm -hmm. controller class that exposes a store value and a fetch value, right. which is just called from Ajax. I'll put the code for this on my blog so you can go look at it. But um, that's what it does. And look how easy the API is. Um, I, so I'm using this uh, data cache factory to get my cache, and then I'm calling add with a key and a value, and I'm calling get with a key. 
Um, <laughs> all right, <laughs> and, uh, so much for complex chord. And, yeah, like so, so I've been found out. It turns out as the dev, I didn't have a very hard, <laughs> hard time with this either. And this was pretty, this is sort of the most manual thing you'll ever do with the cache. So this is, if you're using the cache sort of in your application logic, this right. is what you'll do. You'll, you'll actually, there are a number of different, add is not the only thing you can do here. You can do, um, you, can, you can do sort of, atomic increment or you can do okay. sort of a conditional like put it in the cache but only if it's not already there yeah, and whatever, you know yeah. there there are a whole bunch of things you can look at the IntelliSense will tell you all the stuff you can do right. um, but it's uh, it's basically one thing we haven't mentioned is that there's a Windows Server component yes there's a Windows Server app fabric cache which is the uh, the basically the same thing same as this but on on Windows same. Server it's uh, the the caching service is a subset of the functionality that's in Windows Server caching. So there are a few operations. The reason I like point this out now is because if you do look at IntelliSense and you see the list of of, of commands that you can commands. do, the the commands that you can do against caching is actually a subset of what you can do right. against Windows Server cache. But the basics. You're right. And the blog there. actually covers the key differences, like you can use notifications in one place and yep. notifications are not yet in Azure. Uh, a lot of the other options are more on the admin side, which is we don't have HA off the cache itself. Uh, so things like that are definitely detailed on the blog. Yeah. Uh, and in the example that we've taken, it's a key value. The value could be text. Yep. Or the ca value could actually be any .NET serializable yeah. object. So you can actually keep any object, uh, whether it's an image. So you can actually say Steve and actually have Steve's picture. Or you can have Steve and Steve's title. Uh, it, as long as the object is serializable, you can pretty much use cache to store any data, data type that uh, you can serialize and keep, yeah. keep here. So yeah, you'll see here that it's it's an add with a string for the key. The key mm -hmm. is always a string. And then it's an object. Um, uh, so yeah, all these, it's actually, it's always an object on this one. There aren't overloads for these things. So it's really just an object. I happen to be storing a string all the time because I typed it in in a text box. Right. Um, you'll see the same thing on the get. The get, re get will return an object. Um, and right, they do the .NET serialization and deserialization Correct. either way. Um, we we should talk about hey can we make that change right now how do we do that um, you can turn on the local cache also so so right now this is doing every time I store something it is going to the uh, the caching service and storing it and every mm -hmm. time I retrieve it it's actually going to the caching service okay. and asking for it back it, you might want to take a shortcut, which is just to keep it in memory, just on the local machine. Mm -hmm. So just keep it in, my app is running, but you know what, I'm on a bigger machine than I really need anyway. I've got RAM mm -hmm. that I'm not actually using. Um, right. Why don't I just stick a copy in there as well? And you can absolutely do that, um, and that way your your reads can, can be, uh, I guess instantaneous. I mean, it's in memory, okay. and it's not serialized, right? It's, not it's, serialized at all. it's in memory as the <laughs> .NET object that you originally stored, which means, the retrieval, I get, in some sense, it's right to say that retrieval zero is seconds. zero time. Like, yeah. I mean, it's actually, you already have it in memory. There's just a reference that's getting handed back um, to that object that you already stored. I wonder if it's more complicated than that, because I wonder if you get a copy of the, I mean, is there actually, so is there any cost to retrieving there this There is thing? no cost, because it's, so no cost. We, and the typical demo that we show is, uh, you know, you hitting disk with SQL Azure or Azure Storage, mm -hmm. and it, it's at the order of 10, to 10 milliseconds to fetch it. You start using in-memory cache. Uh, network is way faster than disk is normally. So you drop it down to five milliseconds. The minute you start using local cache, you're on then, the box, then it's just in the app, it's zero. You already have it, right? So, it's, um, so using local cache is another uh, important tip to, to note that. How do I turn it on? We did, I, I on didn't the, prepare for this. Is it a setting right here somewhere? On the, yeah, it's on the client config. So on, uh, yeah. sorry, the client config. So Wait, in this case, you're using system web uh, which is the other thing we should talk about, which is this is the code snippet you need, or actually the config snippet you need to just turn on uh, ASP.NET session state to start using caching. Oh, right, this, doing right. this bit that I've got commented out here, this this would just change my session state from in proc or whatever to, to use the, Correct. the so caching So this is service. excellent for people who don't even want to write one line of code to right. start using the benefits of caching. Yep. This is and you do the same thing for the output cache for your like you, you can actually get the HTML that you're outputting mm -hmm. to get stored in cache also, right. um, which is and that's another config only change um, that you make. Um, okay, I should have known how to. There's probably an attribute I can stick somewhere. Isn't we'll it? Put that in the, in the blog right, post we'll as well. To, we'll have to uh, tell people how to do it. It's not like right here. All right, fine. I give up. Um, <laughs> I didn't prepare in advance, and so I don't get to show you exactly what it is. Uh, oh but this is it. See, I did take cloud cover as the namespace. 
<laughs> for this one. And so that's, that's it. So what I actually added here, which was just sort of copy pasted from the portal, is I added this. And that's all I needed to make that code that I showed work, the controller code. I, I added a couple reference to the right the references to the assemblies, yes. right? And then I right. just put in this data cache client uh, XML snippet, which I just copy and pasted from the portal. Correct. That was enough so that in code I didn't have to specify this URL this and the, the big authorization, authorization key. key. This you is can do cool. it from code if you want, but yes. it's nicer to stick it in config. And then the only other thing here, this is actually commented out because I'm not using it, but we, but um, the session state would go in here or the output cache would go in here. Okay. Um, and that's actually all there is to it. And I, I think I just want to underscore that, like, that, well, one, did we mention that it is free until August 1st? Yes. I think August 1st. So all the pricing that we talked about, forget it because you get to for the next couple months um, use this completely for free. So now is a good time. Now that it's it's actually production quality, it's shipping, right? Now is a good time if you haven't been looking at caching already to go bolt it into some apps. Um, and I hope we've shown that it's actually, it's a couple clicks and then copy pasting some config and you're basically there. Um, so there's really no excuse not to try this out and um, just get a feel for it. Take a look at the statistics in the portal, see how the your use of it is going mm -hmm. so that you know when it comes time to actually pay a bill for this sort of thing, is it going to be worth it? What size cash do you need, um, et cetera. And uh, so there's no, there's no reason not to go, to go look at this. Um, and, uh, and for the most part, cash ends up paying for itself because the amount of uh, pressure that you reduce from data to you yeah. and yeah. You know, the cost associated with doing that or just the complexity of managing court for the cash, the price that you pay, it kind of pays for itself pretty quickly. For, that's right. if, you, if you have a use for caching, yeah. right? I mean, so, so yeah. I mean, make sure that your data is actually yes, cacheable, cacheable and whatever. But right. if you have a use for that, it's much like I make the same argument about the CDN all the mm -hmm. time, which is that, look, if you can get the CDN to do that work, that's well worth it. And so all exactly. you need is something where you think right. the cache hits are going to happen. Um, yeah. If you're always missing the cache, then it does no good for you. In fact, it would slow things it down because you'd be checking the, the cache and mm -hmm. failing to find it all the time. Um, but as long as you have something where where the cash hit rate is good, that's the thing I would look at the most is mm -hmm. how often do you actually have a cash hit, and if that uh, if that's often, especially when you turn on the local cash and wherever there's there's nothing but upside. Right. And as you said, if that offloads, if that means you need one less VM running your web server or something, that's okay. a significant okay. savings. Uh, so I think the, the so typical cases that we keep hearing is if you if you ever use uh, ASP Rock in a session state to keep a lot of session objects. Yeah. Clear, clear case where you get a performance gain, for sure. Uh, if you have a lot of reference data, like you, you know, loading stock tickers or <coughs> stock news gator, yeah. the RSS feeds because that's another, another place to keep a lot of in-memory uh, data where you can quickly process as opposed to keep fetching it, uh, <coughs> or you keeping just things like product catalogs or yeah. you know, sh airline inventory. Those are very clear cases where you just see a significant uh, both performance benefit as well as cost reduction in the overall solution just by offloading that work to cash. But much like CDN, if it does it for you, why bother doing it again? Right. Um, OK, I think that's about all we needed mm -hmm. to show here uh, for caching, which means we're on to my favorite part of the show, which is not actually the tip of the week, but the introduction to the tip <laughs> of the week by our wonderful editor, Bob. And I think it's only fair. So last week, I watched the show last week, and, and Bob put in a video of what I must have been doing in Vegas that week <laughs> while I was there. I think with Wade in what we suspect is Amsterdam, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I think that we should see a video of the highlights of what Wade is doing in Europe while he's not here. And so, um, Bob, if you, could, if you could put something together for that, that would be great. Yeah, we'll uh, do it. NSFW disclaimer, but yeah, yeah, let's, let's you know, keep it important. safe, Bob. But uh, <laughs> here is your tip of the week. And we're back. Thank you, Bob. Um, that was lovely and educational. Um, <laughs> so we uh, the word. we decided that we're gonna, as our tip, we're gonna do the thing that I didn't know how to do just a second ago. But magically, during this couple seconds while you're watching that little video, we figured out how to do it. Um, and uh, <laughs> this is the line of code. 
<laughs> uh, let me let me get some white space around it so it's easier to spot. This is this is it the, to turn on that local cache. So this is if I do want to use some of the memory that I have on the local machine right. to store some objects um, locally, so I don't even have to make the network hop to fetch them from cache. Um, uh, this is what you do. So you add a local cache element just under that data cache client thing. Um, is enabled equals true. I suppose you could put false there, but then why did you add it? Um, <laughs> so this is useful when you want to just keep toggling because you can do it, do the toggle through. So code. you can at least just turn on the I see, I see. So if you start, start it's, seeing a it's lot of It's especially handy for demos because yes. then you can put a little checkbox <laughs> and turn it on and off. Yeah, they built it for me. Um, so that's <laughs> it. It was just for you to do demos. Okay, and then sync equals timeout based. That's the only thing that you can use. Um, if you were okay. using the server app fabric, server, right, then you'd have some other options here. Notifications as well, but it, right. for for Azure app fabric caching, this is the only timeout based. This is it. And, and it's probably what you would have thought you'd if you didn't know anything about this. Timeout based is probably what you'd expect, which okay. is well, as you store objects, they're going to have some expiration date, and after that, they're going to get evicted from the cache. And this is that expiration date, so the TTL value, time to live tells you in seconds, uh, right? So yeah, 300 seconds is five minutes. So, um, but you put whatever you want in here and basically say, well, look, after I've stored something after five minutes, consider it stale, it gets evicted. Right. Um, that so means the next time you're yes. you're going to, you're going to have to go fetch it. Well, you may fetch it from the app fabric cache, right. right? We now have like three tiers of where your data might be, right? right? Presumably you've got it somewhere in like SQL Azure or Windows Azure storage, or maybe you compute it, right? Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the source of the data. And you're storing it in the distributed in-memory cache of App right. Fabric caching the service. Mm -hmm. And now you're also keeping a reference locally once you've already ha seen it on the client. Correct. Client, in this case, being a server. But you know, once on, your, on the local machine where this code is running, once you've seen it, you, may, you can keep a version there too. And so okay. you'll sort of have to fall back progressively as you And the big difference there. is uh, in the first one, when you fetch data from, let's say, SQL or somewhere mm -hmm. else and keep it in, in, in cache, in the distributed cache, that's an explicit step, or right. what we like to call the cache aside pattern, where you have to make a choice between what data you really want to cache. The good thing with the local cache is it's completely transparent. It just happens. It just happens. So right. every so time you fetch the data, it, and if you haven't hit the this total uh, object count limit, it just keep it locally so that you don't have to worry about bringing and storing it. And as soon as the timeout gets expired, it'll just discard it. So, so one is a transparent cache, which is a local one. And the second one is an explicit cache that you have to program against and use uh, as needed. The best part about using local cache, and that's the reason why it makes us a tip of the week, is it's absolutely free. So you don't pay for any extra uh, local cache usage or local cache memory or local cache uh, SDK. It's just part, the minute you pay and buy for the cache tier, you can just start using local cache client and get the, the performance benefits. So. And this last thing that you can set is basically the size of the local cache, and it's specified in the number of objects. And that's because they're not actually stored serialized. You're not actually counting bytes anymore, because you actually have, it's a reference to some object. Um, and it's just sort of held around in, in sort of the .NET way that you've sort of, you haven't garbage collected because you've got a reference. I mean, it's basically right. just, just keeping that the object be. in memory. Um, which means, it, I, f I find it, frankly, a little bit awkward to think about number of objects in the cache versus uh, the size, because I'm used to thinking in terms right. of like right. the RAM that I'm using and whatever. And I think I know what the, I can go look in Task Manager and see how much of that is free. Mm -hmm. Well, how many objects I can store? Now I actually have to maybe do a little math or maybe just watch this and sort of okay. learn. And so I think that's one place where people might have a little have bit a of a discount. ramp. Yes. Like there's a little learning curve here of what right. should I actually set this value to? And normally, uh, this is excellent when you want to use something like uh, session state. Mm -hmm. We're expecting the number of users to be, let's say, 1,000 users hitting my website. So you know I'm going to have 1,000 session state objects. Uh, yeah. So if you were to map it directly with the number of users and the number of objects you create for them, that's an easier math. But if it's just a mashup of a lot of data, you're right. It can get a little, there's right. some dissonance there. Yeah, yeah. So, but I mean, it's not hard to learn what the right. number is for this, and because you can monitor all the, you can monitor the usage, the RAM usage of your app, and sort of learn this because this is in the same process with your with your app and whatever. <coughs> so it's very obvious to you mm -hmm. sort of where this is, and you can tune that over. And that's time. why we actually kept this in the config, so you can you know keep tweaking these settings without ever having to worry about oh I need to touch my code again. It's yeah. all config settings. So play with that. 
Cool. So that was so that's our that's our tip. Then that's our show. So um, uh, as always, you can interact with the show by going onto Twitter and saying something to at Cloud Cover Show, and uh, we we always we read all those and then promptly ignore them and never discuss <laughs> what was asked. But uh, on occasion, somebody asks something that is that we then incorporate in the show, and so it is based on. Uh, we actually had a question about caching a little while ago. Um, we do try to sort of cover the things that you guys are asking about, um, so do that. And I think uh, I think next week Wade and I will both be in the same city at the same time, which hasn't happened for a mm -hmm. little while. The real Wade. And so we'll have a yeah, the other Wade. That I mean, I'm sorry. I mean that you will lose your tan and then, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then you will be back uh, as people remember you. And so um, next week we will we will see you as the original Stephen Wade pair. Until then, thanks a lot. <laughs>